And now if you look at the system, well, we said that the two states were mutually distinguishable. So that means that some, at least theoretical experiment, <coughs> that distinguishes between state A and state B. If you look at the system, the chance of seeing in state A is absolute value of alpha squared, and state B is absolute value of beta squared. So, so yeah. the, the potential alpha given A is like an notation Okay, so this, I'll this notation in a little while. This funny cat, this um, left line and this right bracket means it's a quantum state. Okay. And I will tell you more about what this means. I mean, this is really very thin and it becomes much nicer when you, when you use it in mathematics. So in mathematics, Quantum states are the unit factors in a complex vector space. <coughs> so these A and B are just unit factors in some large quantum vector space, a large vector space. So we'll work with finite dimensional vector spaces in this problem. And modifying a quantum state by a unit complex space does not change the essential quantum state. That's one of the axioms of quantum mechanics. Two quantum states are distinguishable if they are represented by orthogonal vectors. And if one tests whether the quantum state is vector psi, a quantum state phi has probably the inner product of phi and psi squared of passing the same um, Okay. So we call a two-dimensional quantum system a qubit. And you know. Classical information is very classical computer science. You work with bits, which are just two state systems. Well, a two state quantum system is a two dimensional vector space because there's only two distinguishable states, because you can only have two orthogonal vectors in two dimensional vector space. And the example that most people are familiar with are you know, polarization of light. If you have a polarized photon, there can only be two distinguishable states. You can choose, say, horizontal and vertical, which are two distinguishable states. And these two faces of the state. And so all other states are, you, know, you have a basis of a two dimensional system, everything can be expressed in terms of the basis. And you get right polarization, or right diagonal polarization is one over two horizontal plus one over two vertical. Left diagonal polarization has to be orthogonal because you can tell the difference between right diagonal. Out, I spin up plus one over two. 
true spin down. Okay. So those are completely indistinguishable quantum states. And so if you're a mathematician, you can think of a you know, quantum state space as not a vector space, but a projective vector space. You know what that means. <coughs> and the problem with doing that is it makes all the calculations. I mean, you don't want to use projective vector spaces when you're doing calculations because it makes everything a lot more difficult. But if you're doing, um, you know, if you're thinking about them theoretically, not the right way to think about them. So notation. So physicists use the Keck notation this to represent the quantum state. And you should think of this as a column through V. And the bra, this is called a cap. And this is called a bra, which is a corresponding row vector, which is a conjugate transpose V star plus V. And a bra cap. Which you can see where the notation came from. It's just the inner body of the It's a pun. It's a pun, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> a bracket. <laughs> so this is Dirac's notation, if you want to know who's responsible for the pun. <laughs> and I am going to be using both, you know, just the and the star and this bracket. Partly because these slides were assembled by for several talks, and I didn't have to, didn't really want to uh, make everything uniform because I probably would have you know, introduced a bunch of errors. And recall that V was a unit vector, so the inner product of V with V conjugate transpose is one. Okay, so. What happens in what's a joint state space is a tensor product of individual state spaces. So each of these was a two-dimensional quantum state space. Your joint product is two times two is a four-dimensional quantum state space. And two quantum bits can be in any superposition of a four state up, 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 down, down, up, or down, down. So these form the basis for the tensor product of the two states. You just take the tensor product of the two bases. And you know, I could have been um, kept vertical polarization, tensor, kept vertical polarization, but this is an easier way to uh, get the same thing. So this is the first one bit, this is the second one bit. And this includes states such as an e pair, e pair pair of photons, one over two, <coughs> vertical horizontal minus horizontal vertical, which turns out is the same thing as one over two, right diagonal, left diagonal, minus left diagonal, right diagonal. And here, neither cubic alone is that of state. So these are called entangled states. Well, that, I shouldn't say so. I, <coughs> but this is the definition of entangled state as a state where neither one cubic alone has a definite state. Sorry, EPR stands for? Oh, EPR stands for Einstein, Brodowski, Rosen, which, who wrote a paper, oh. I think in the 1930s, Say, you know, you have a state. So they didn't use um, polarization or spin, they used momentum and position. But if you have a state with, which is essentially this with momentum and position, which are continuous variables in an infinite dimensional word state, so it's a little more complicated. But if you have a state like this, then these particles behave very strangely. And they said, well, these behave very strangely, therefore, quantum mechanics can't be the whole picture, there must be something deeper behind it. And since we've gone off, since then we've gone on, and you know, most physicists don't think there's anything deeper behind it. They think quantum mechanics really is the whole picture. Yeah? So, I mean, maybe this is a dumb question, but oh, what do you mean, can you just elaborate on what you mean by where either qubit along has a definite state? So, well, I mean, if you Okay, it means that this is not, um, cannot be expressed as psi. So it cannot be expressed, this thing cannot be expressed as <coughs> one in one state, tensor and cubic two in another state. So, and if that's, I, this is a little calculation which proves how. So suppose you have 1 over 2 qubit 
1 in some state and give it 2 in the orthogonal state, minus give it 2 in the <coughs> and your orthogonal state, give it 1 in the orthogonal state, give it 2 in the state of the first one. So basically, these particles are anti-symmetric under a chain. So if you switch that, if you switch the two particles, you multiply the state by a minus sign. Well, you can write this in terms of the vertical horizontal basis. So let's say this is alpha vertical plus beta horizontal. Then this has to be a orthogonal state, and we'll say beta vertical minus alpha horizontal. So we're assuming that alpha and beta are real here to make things easier. But you know, this it still works. I mean, exactly the same thing happens when they're not real. And now minus. So that was the first term, minus beta vertical minus alpha horizontal. That's this. Times alpha vertical plus beta horizontal. Now what you can do is you can multiply this out, use the distributive property to get. Well, let's move the vertical vertical terms. You get alpha, beta, minus beta, alpha. So the vertical vertical terms go away. What about that? What about this term? Well, that's beta horizontal times beta vertical minus alpha horizontal minus minus alpha horizontal times alpha vertical. So that's beta squared plus alpha squared. But these are happy to be in a vector, so alpha squared plus beta squared equals one, so you get this. So no matter which spaces you put these in, they're always orthogonal. And I guess you can also see that by the fact that as you interchange the two particles. You multiply this, you multiply the phase by minus one. So that's another way of seeing this. But this, you know, at least gives you an example of how to do calculations with quantum states. So if you have n qubits, their joint equations is described by a two to the n dimensional vector. So we're now going to drop these vertical horizontal polarizations or spin them. Label basic factors for each qubit by zero and one, which, for information theorists or computer scientists, is actually much more natural. And so the basis states of the vector space are n zeros, n minus one zeros, and one. In fact, all two to the n possible strings of zeros and ones. And that's one basis for this vector space. Of course, there are lots and lots of other bases. And so the high dimensional tensor product space is where. I think high dimensionality of the Spencer product space is one of the places that quantum. Okay, the high dimensional tensor product is where quantum information theory lives. And also, this high dimensionality is where quantum computation gets its power. So, let's see. So, density matrices. So, right, so far we've been doing dealing with pure states. Now, in quantum mechanics, the fundamental objects are. Well, if you take physics 101, the fundamental question is called physics, I think, 4 at um, MIT. The fundamental objects are often taken to be pure quantum states, so unit vectors and any dimensions. But these are analogous to deterministic objects in classical systems. And information theory really deals with probability distribution. So for that, we need to work with probability distributions over quantum series. And what these are, not, but these, the way to represent these properly is high like density. Excuse me. Excuse me. Yeah. So pure quantum state, how is it different from a quantum state? A, a pure quantum state is something, everything I've said so far is a pure quantum state. Okay. And a probability distribution over pure quantum state are called mixed quantum states, or, okay. yeah, and they're represented by density. So, what a density matrix is, suppose you have an n-dimensional quantum system, a density matrix is information, which means the conjugate transpose of a matrix is equal to the matrix trace one positive semi-definite matrix over C of the n. So that's an n by n. Trace one positive sum of the matrix. And positive means all the other values are larger than or equal to zero. So you call it not negative if you were a mathematician. <coughs> and a rank one density matrix 
this corresponds to a pure state. Um, that's a vector in CDM. And density matrices arise from pure states in two ways. <coughs> the first way is suppose you have a quantum state system, which is a state V sub i with probability k sub i. The density matrix is rho, which is summation over i v sub i times v sub i v sub i dagger. Now v sub i v sub i dagger for each of these quantum vectors is uh, you know, is a rank one density matrix. So if you just have one, if you just have just one quantum state with probability one, you get a rank one density matrix. And if you have a bunch of different quantum states, you get a density matrix. You get a density matrix that is higher than one, rank higher than one. And the really nice thing about density matrices is that the density matrix gives as much information as is possible to know about the outcomes of experiments performed on the system. So if we know the density matrix, there's lots of ways of getting, having two different probability distributions over quantum states that give the same density matrix. But if you know the density matrix, that tells you as much information as you can need to know to predict the outcomes of experiments on the system. So two systems with the same density matrix row are indistinguishable. You can't tell the difference. <coughs> so the major outcomes that any experiment performed upon the system depend only on the density matrix. So let's go back and prove this. We can prove this in the simplest possible way. So remember, if you perform the measurement on the system in state, in state V sub i, with probability V sub i, <coughs> and you test whether it's in state E, then the probability that you get it in state E is the, this inner product of V sub i and E, absolute value of that squared. So if E is one of the possible outcomes of the measurement, the probability of seeing E is summation over all i, the probability that's in state i times E probably seen E given the <coughs> state of I. Okay, so now we can say that's just V sub I, e, inner product of E, V sub I times inner product of V sub I, E. And now we can move this summation inside this uh, product, and you get E times the summation over I, P sub I, V sub I, um, V sub I conjugate transpose. Yeah? Um, so we talk about the measurement uh, of the system as that outcome. I assume that's not dependent on some specific experimental technique. Like, where does um, that come from? Or? Well, I mean, so you can take, yeah, so if you have a experiment on a quantum system, you can say, well, this is going to give you some <coughs> some outcome and you would express this measurement. Well, actually, we've only talked about quantum limit measurements so far, which are specific capacity measurements. But it turns out you can express any measurement you can experiment you can make on a quantum system and the result of that essentially in this way. And I'll get to that a little bit later. Sorry, just another question. Yeah. Can you Tell me why need the square to be obtained to obtain the probability. I mean, I remember that at the beginning you defined right. alpha squared plus b squared equal to yeah. one half. But why do you need the square for to define the probability? Well, I mean, if you have <coughs> okay, uh, well, another measurement measures it along some basis vector, so it would be one, e two, e three, yeah. and suppose you have a state v here, um, summation over e sub i. Where you can use one. So if you want these probabilities of sum to one, you better square this. And why does quantum mechanics work that way? I don't know. I mean that's that's someone I something I don't think anybody can know. If you want probability to behave properly like sum to one, you need to square the product to get to the sum to one. But you know, this is really one of the axioms of quantum mechanics. <laughs> I don't think there's, I don't know if there's any way to explain why quantum mechanics works this way. So it's, a, it's really a physical property. Yeah. It's a physical property of how the world works. I thought it was some sort of mathematical need that we study that to respond to a physical principle. Well, I mean, if you want, if you want to have a consistent theory of the world, 
<laughs> it's really, you know, I mean, people have tried coming up with theories of the world which look like quantum mechanics, or are quite quantum mechanics. And it's very hard to come up with, to make them work consistently. So this, you know, quantum mechanics is one consistent way the world can operate. Classical, you know, classical uh, probability distributions is another consistent way the world can operate. But there's, um, you know, there's not that many choices. So here, so, so that means, so now we can move the sum inside this product with e, the state E, and inside here, because E is just, it's just a vector. That's what this is. It's linear, so you can move the sum inside because E doesn't have a piece of I, and you get E times summation over P sub I, P sub I, P sub I, E, times you get transpose E, which is just E well E, which is, um, yeah, <coughs> which only depends on the density matrix and not on the actual ensemble of quantum states and probability distributions. Okay. And the other way of getting the density matrix from a quantum system is suppose you have a joint quantum system, and the first is a, you know, the first, it's always. quantum system which has two parts, the first we'll call A and the second we'll call D. first one's A-dimensional, the second is B-dimensional. So suppose you throw away the second part, and you can only do experiments on the first part of the system. Then it's going to behave as if it's in the state rho sub A, which is equal to the partial trace of B rho A B. And what is the partial trace? Well, if you have a tensor product state, rho A B equals rho A tensor rho B, then when you find the partial trace on <coughs> row A, B, is just the trace on row sub B times row sub A. So we just take the trace of the second density matrix and multiply it by the first density matrix. And now we have a quantum a density matrix, which is in the first quantum system. And now this is definition on Tensor product on states which happen to be tensor product states, so non entangled states. But we can extend this linearly to define the partial trace on entangled states. And if we refer to an explicit formula for the partial trace in terms of the matrix, so suppose you have a dense joint system and the density matrix looks like this so B11, B12, B13, B21, B22, B23, etc. <coughs> And then the trace of A of this thing, well, if you want a system which is a state B, e, or rather, you want to, you want to get, you want, you want the system. What the result to be something in state B is just B11 plus B22 plus B33. And the trace on B, if you just take the trace of each of the um, matrices here, so now this is a uh, density matrix over the system A. There's only a few more slides about quantum, you know, the fundamentals of quantum mechanics, and then we'll uh, actually start talking about uh, quantum information theory. And uh, you're not going to, I, I'll refer back to this, but I don't think you'll have to remember everything I said just to understand the second part. So suppose you have a quantum state C to the end. A von Neumann measurement on this corresponds to a complete set of orthogonal subspaces S1, S2, S10, where complete means the orthogonal subspaces span C to the end. And you can let pi sub S sub I be the projection matrix on the pi subspace S sub I. So there's a corresponding von Neumann measurement for this decomposition into orthogonal subspaces. And if you apply it to the density matrix rho, this corresponding von Neumann measurement. Take rho to the projection of rho onto the I probability space, the probability trace pi s sub i rho. So the simplest situation is each of these, each of these s sub i is one dimensional, 
then s sub i is just you know, a one dimensional well, rank one guessing matrix, which is just a quantum state, or a pure quantum state. So that's p sub i, p sub i there. And these p sub i's form a basis of c to the n, and the probability seen this already, if you have a density matrix row, then the probability that it's in state S sub i, if you make this density matrix, is the trace of P sub i, P sub i dagger row, which is actually P sub i row of P sub i dagger, which is what we saw before. <coughs> If you have a system which is a state k with probably p sub k, it's summation minus p sub a mo p sub k. Well, let's think about quantum states. Suppose you have n photons, <coughs> and each is either vertically polarized or horizontally polarized. Well, any two of these states is completely distinguishable, so they should really just behave like classical objects. And now the entropy is going to be n bits. Now, suppose you have n photons, each in state, vertical or diagonal is not distinguishable from work. Well, the angle between these polarizations is small. If the angle between these polarizations is zero, then the quantum, <coughs> you know, the end photons can only be in one state, so the entropy is zero. If the angle between these polarizations is small, then any two of these states are barely distinguishable, and intuitively you think the entropy should be much less than n bits. Well, von Neumann thought about but entropy, if you look at classical thermodynamics, entropy can be used to do work, and you have relations between energy, work, and entropy. And if you look at thermodynamic arguments, and if you use the entropy of a quantum system with density matrix rho is minus trace rho log rho. And you call rho is positive semi-definite. So rho log rho, it turns out, is defined. And if rho is diagonal, with positive values lambda is by, and the minus rho log rho is diagonal with i values minus lambda i log lambda r. And of course, you can always diagonalize any density, any permission matrix. So that means that if you, uh, you know, if this is a way of defining rho log rho, you can also define rho log rho in terms of a power series. So if h of rho is Entropy of rho is the entropy of the eigenvalue of rho. So the von Neumann entropy of the density matrix is just the shadow entropy of the eigenvalue of rho. So that was our brief review of quantum mechanics. So now, quantum information theory. So first, let's talk about source code. So source code is called Schumacher compression because Schumacher was the one came up with the um, you know, formula for, or came up with a theory of source code. And this is really the quantum noiseless coding theory. Or, excuse me. <coughs> so given a memoryless source that produces pure states v1, v2, v3, with probabilities of p1, p2, p3, etc. So each time the source is going to output a quantum state, and it outputs quantum state p sub i with probability p sub i. And now somehow, you want to send them to a receiver using as few qubits as possible. <coughs> well, I haven't told you exactly how you manipulate quantum states. So it turns out you can manipulate quantum states by doing, by performing unitary transformations on the matrices. <coughs> but we're not going to need to go into detail over that in the future. So you can send n symbols. Schumacher showed that you can send n symbols using n times the entropy of rho plus little o n qubits. With a fidelity approaching 1 as n goes to infinity. So fidelity means that if you test whether these n symbols, well, so you're getting these symbols the source. So you don't know what pure states the source is 
producing. And in fact, there's no way you can tell what pure state the source is producing because you did not measure an unknown quantum state and get all the information out of it. But the, you know, the memoryless source could keep a record of which states it produces. So fidelity is, suppose you take these ten symbols, you compress them, you send them to a noiseless channel, and the receiver uncompresses them, and now the source sends the record of the quantum states to some tester over here in the um, other, other side of the channel. So there's a source. I should have clearly thought one of these diagrams. <coughs> Compress. Um, expand. Decompress. And test. So the source can send information about exactly which symbols it is to this tester, and he can you know, perform a quantum measurement to say, well, did a receiver construct them properly? And you want is that the, this test comes out, um, yes, they were the same symbols, with probably one, and this n goes to infinity. And we'll let rho, the summation pi, 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 pi dagger, is a density matrix of the source, and you can send Third, you can send n symbols using n and the entropy of the source. So that puts a lot of money on um, classical data compression. You have a question? So the symbols are independent of the density matrix, right? The density matrix is just what you use as the code words? The density? No, no, well, it, well. So the symbols are not some, you know, combination of the well, NBA transpose. Um, Right, the, well, the symbol, I mean, V1, V1 could be a uh, vertical right point, V2 could be right angle, and V3 could be a left angle. Yeah, sure. Um, probability going out <coughs> one quarter to one quarter of the thing. Now we want to compute rho. So rho is equal to one half. Well, so V1 one is this density matrix <coughs> plus one quarter. And what is the density matrix of that? That's one half, one half, one half, one half. Because that's just, so this was one over two. Um, so let's represent it in terms of matrices one and one. And now we take, the, take this kind of country to transform it get one half, one half, plus one quarter, one half, one minus one half, two minus one half, one half. So the density matrix of this should be um, rho is equal to three quarters, one quarter, and h of rho is equal to h of three quarters. Producing these three symbols with these probabilities. So now you send them to the compressor. The compressor does something to them. I'll tell you what in another slide or two. And compresses them. So if you have n qubits here, you end up with n times h of three quarters, whatever that is, somewhat, you know, somewhat less than. My question, was the, what? Well, my question was the definition of symbol. So it is a pure state? It's a pure state. Okay. Here a symbol is a pure state. Yeah. And we get n times h of three quarters qubits. And each, you know, these n times h of three quarters qubits are all going to be very entangled. And then you get it, and then the receiver then undoes this compression, and you get something that looks very much like the original n. So you're trying to reconstruct the density matrix. You're trying to well, actually, the um, the original well, no, the original this the original qubits are in a sort of pure state, but only the source knows the pure state. Right, right. But you want the you want you want the output 
could be, well, it's going to be a density matrix, but it's going to be a density matrix that is very, very close to this first vector. The rank one, approximately rank one. Approximately rank one. Sorry, I got confused with the tester. Could you repeat the tester? Yeah. So the tester, so, so I guess the, the original thing is, uh, is, you can think of it as pure state. And what you want is you want a density matrix, which is going to, I mean, you can express a density matrix, mean, which if you, okay, so, so rows of out, some kind of Vn, Vn is equal to 1 minus epsilon. So you take this row out, which is a 2 to the n times h of 3 quarters um, by 2 to the n times h of 3 quarters density matrix, and you test whether it's, and you, you want to check whether this inner product of this uh, the density matrix with the input vector is nearly one. And if you wanted to do this, if you wanted to do this with an experiment, you could just test each of these reconstructed qubits one at a time, and that would be the same um, probability. So, how does the proof for the classical source code be built? Well, there are well. Assume we have some source x that emits symbols s1, s2, etc. with probabilities p1, p2, etc. So consider a sequence of n symbols from this piece. Then a typical sequence, well, you can define as having as something that has close to the right number, that's n times p sub i, and each symbol has sub i. Or you can define it as, well, you can also define it in terms of probability q1. And the theorem is that almost all of the time the source emits a typical sequence. And there are two to the n times entropy of the s. That's a little of n typical sequences. Let's see. What's the next slide? So how do you do this? Well, you know, the easy way, or the simple way to prove this theorem is let's just assign each typical sequence a number, and then just the center sends the number of these typical sequence. And the receiver looks up the number and reconstructs the typical sequence. And since almost all the time, the source of the typical sequence, almost all the time, this source coding works. And the probability that it doesn't work is very small. And of course, if the source is not, if the output is not a typical sequence, it won't work. But we don't care about this because the probability of that is small, which means that it works nearly all the time. <coughs> so how do we do Schumacher convolution? Well, what we're going to do is define a typical substance. So this is the most um, technical part of this talk. So once we're through this, I'm just going to start waving my hands a lot more. So, um, so you have states v1, v2, through vk, and the probabilities are p1, p2, through vk. And let's look at the eigenvectors of the density matrix rho, which is summation p sub i, p sub i, p sub i, delta. So this, we want to compress it to h times, h, the entropy of rho times n qubits. So what we're going to do is we're going to assign each eigenvector the probability equal to the corresponding eigenvalue. And because it's a so this density matrix is Hermitian and trace one. The, these eigenvalues add up to one, they're all positive, which means they're probably distribution. And any two eigenvectors are orthogonal, we'll just by the property of Hermitian matrices, they have orthogonal eigenvectors. So let's let the eigenvectors be v1 half, v2 half, to vk half. Actually, this k doesn't have to be this k, so I should have um, Use different, I should have used a different symbol for it. The problem with P1 half to P half. Well, these two ensembles are the same as the matrix rho. Why? Because, well, a summation P sub i, V sub i half, V sub i, 
Israel because I think this is the way ideologies and ideologies vectors work. So suppose we have n of these quantum states. So we have n states drawn from this probability distribution. The typical subspace is a subspace that is generated by all typical sequences of eigenvectors. So the typical subspace is a subspace with such that typical sequences of eigenvectors are its basis. And the typical subspace has dimension to the entropy of rho times n plus a little n, just because that's how the typical sequences of eigenvectors there are. So now we find a subspace in this, well, um, k again dimensional space. So how do you do Schumacher compression? Well, what we do is we compress is we have a subspace. That means that there's a well-known amendment which asks, is this input sequence of, you know, we ask, is this output of the source? It's either in, you would ask, but, well, does it, either you reject it onto the individual subspace or you reject it onto the complement of the individual subspace. So you measure whether the output of the source lies in this subspace. And if it's close to the subspace, well, if yes, the answer is you get the state projected onto the optimal measurement is the state projected onto the subspace. And the subspace had true the n times entropy of rho dimension, which means you can go apply this unitary transformation, which maps it into n times h of rho cubits. Because if it's a true to the n times h of rho dimensional space, then you can represent it as true to the times n times h of rho qubits. And if the output is no, then this is a low probability event. You can send anything. So this works a lot like Shannon compression. You measure whether the output is in the typical subspace. Yes, then you can compress the typical subspace to n times h of rho plus the little n qubits, and no, well, your encoding is not going to work, but it doesn't matter because this happens with very small probability. Why does this work? Well, we call that the density matrix determines the outcome of the experiment. So, if you know, remember that also remember that eigenvectors b1 half, b2 half, to b k half. Probably p1 half, p2 half, pk half. It's the same probability of outcomes using states b1, b2, bk, with probability p1, p2, p2, pk. And now we know from the classical theory of typical subspaces, if the actual source had been the source up to these rather than these, we would really be in a classical situation because any two of these are orthogonal. So from the classical theory of typical subspaces, the probability of a no outcome is very small with pi half and pi half. Thus, the probability of a no outcome is also very small with pi and pi because it's the same probability. So that means that if the probability of a no outcome is very small, the original state is almost surely very close to the typical subspace S. And if you have a vector which is very close to a subspace, when you project it into the subspace, you don't disturb it very much, which means that you can, which means that the compression algorithm works with high fidelity. So I'm not that a, you know, a bunch of technical estimates here. So it's not actually like a block reproduction constraint. I mean, the sum of your qubits could be incorrect in the reproduction. Right. Yeah, but they're they're going to be very close. But no, I understand. They're not actually going to be in the right. If you say, is this exactly right, the answer is no. If you measure it, you know, if you have two quantum states which are nearly the same, then if you measure, is this one equal to the, I mean, uh, you can project it either onto this guy or on this complement. And, and or almost all the time, you project it on this guy, which means that the measurement, did this work properly, is going to be the outcome of that measurement. So that is Schumacher for the question. And now I want to talk about channel mode. Another question? Yeah, so I mean this is like an
achievability proof? And right. Is there, I mean, what's the Com intuition behind Converse? Is, uh, is it similar to the classical Converse? It's similar to the classical Converse. So, um, yeah. Right. I mean, you cannot, if you have, uh, you know, if you're trying to compress it to smaller than the dimensional typical subspace, then um, I, yeah, so you, you cannot take a, a quantum state which is uniform on a subspace and compress it to a smaller subspace. And that's <coughs> at least the intuition behind the converse to get the exact. Yeah, I was just curious if there's anything right, that was unique to quantum uh, and converse, but uh, I mean, right. yeah, the intuition is, is good enough. So, yeah. do we have the universal compression version of this? Yes, there are universal compression versions. <coughs> yeah. So now, let's talk about quantum channels. So let's start by considering a special class of quantum channels. So I'm going to talk about channel coding now. And this class, the input is one of k classical symbols, and the output is a density matrix rows of k, which depends only on the input symbol. So the input is classical, and the output is quantum. And these are called ZQ channels. C for the classical input, and Q for the quantum. And there are also QC channels. So here's a theory. So you can ask, well, can you, um, how much information can you send over a CQ channel? There's a similar question, which is about what's called accessible information. So suppose you have a source that comes a signal rows of I, with probably with a piece of I. How much channel information can you extract about the sequence of i's given the summation? And you can let x be the random variable telling which single rows of i is sent. Now let's optimize over all possible measurements m you can make on a single symbol with outcomes m1, m2, et cetera. And the accessible information is defined the maximum between the input random variable telling which single sent rows of i was sent and the measurement. So example one, the you know, we will either send a vertical polarized state or a diagonal polarized state to the diagonal, the angle between them is theta. So V1 is 1, 0, R, and V2 is cosine theta, sine theta. So these are the two vectors. Mm -hmm. Then you can calculate that the density matrix is 1 half, 1 plus cosine squared theta, Cosine sine and one minus cosine squared theta. And the entropy of rho is the entropy of one half plus cos theta over two. Well, so what's the best measurement you can do to get, you know, to distinct, I mean, so you can look at all possible measurements you can make, distinguish between these, the best. As you ask, well, okay, so you take the two orthogonal states, which are symmetric about these two states, and you ask, is it equal to this or equal to this? And the accessible information is 1 minus h of 1 half plus sine theta over 2. So, reasoning from the class of one, well, so here is the entropy of rho, and here is the density matrix, and the accessible information. Or an ensemble of two pure quantum states that differ by an angle of theta. And you see that the accessible information is always less than the one of the Okay, let's try a different thing. But before we try a different example, let's talk about POVM measurements. So I haven't mentioned the POVM measurements, I've just talked about one of the measurements. But POVM measurements are a more general class of measurements. Most general class of measurements allow about quantum mechanics. 
So what you're given is you're given a set of positive semi-definite matrices E sub i that's by summation i E sub i equals i. And the probability of the i cap coming to the innovation is P sub i equals trace of E sub i rho. And remember for von Neumann measurements, we had subspaces and E sub i was projection under the subspace. And we also have summation of i projection of the i subspaces i because of these subspaces of the body. <coughs> von Neumann measurements are special class. And if you want to get the maximum information out of a measurement, you can show that you can assume that the E sub i's are pure change. So E sub i is, wow, I left out. It's going to, E sub i is going to be some constant, rank one things, but not necessarily trace one rank one thing. So E sub i equals some alpha i times the i, the i vector for some vector the Slide. You can always how I mean why so given that you can make on other measurements, how can you show you can make POPM measurements? Well, the way you do it is you can show that you any POPM measurement can be realized by taking the quantum system, any um, X um, no, uh, auxiliary quantum system and starting in some fixed state, and then making a von Neumann measurement on the combined form system. So if you can do von Neumann measurements, and you can also add a fund system to a fixed thing to the original fund system, then you can do arbitrary POVM measurements. So POVM measurements aren't physically any more, um, you know, so physically, if you can do von Neumann measurements, Example two, you have three single states converted by 60 degrees vertical, um, I guess minus 60 degrees and plus 60 degrees. And you have, so these are the three vectors. The optimal measurement for each of these is probably one third is POVM corresponding to the orthogonal things. So each outcome rules out one state and leaves the other two and for this, the accessible one information is log 3 minus 1 because we started with three different states and we ruled out one, so we have two states at the end, so that turned out to be log 3 minus log 2. And the entropy of the um, entropy of the density matrix is 1, so again, you have the accessible information is less than. So now you can ask, well, suppose what you were allowed to do is you were allowed to send one of these three states to a receiver. So your channel is you decide which of these states you want to send. So you have three classical numbers for the input, and the receiver gets a quantum state, which is one of these three, depending on which number you input. The question is, how much, um, how much information can you send? And you can ask, is this the most information? And the answer is no. And the reason is, suppose you use three code words. So we're going to look at length two code words, V1 tensor V1, V2 tensor V2, and V3 tensor V3. So these code words now apply in, well, in the state space of two qubits, which is a four-dimensional state space. And in fact, there's only three of these. So they lie in a three-dimensional subspace of this four-dimensional space. Well, so you can visualize them looking like three, and you can ask what's the optimal measurement for distinguishing these three states. And the optimal measurement of the three, the three basis vectors, which are you get by taking these three states and pulling them apart so that they're orthogonal. So you can make that measurement. You can compute how much information about the original three code words it gives you, and the answer is that it gives you <coughs> the mutual information between the outcome of this and the original code word. Yeah, the original code word is 1.369, which is larger than twice 
well, two minus one. So, so we had a single simple, um, yeah. The optimal measurement which projects onto one of those three axes, or? It projects onto one of those three axes. So there are three optimal measurements? There, no, no, there are three outcomes. Oh, the optimal measurement is? Oh, projects onto these. Three. It's projected onto one of these three axes. In this space. Okay. In the space, depending on, well, so if this is going to project onto this with the inner product, this times the square, yeah. and this projects onto this with probably the okay. inner product of this is the square. Okay. So you just take minus p sub i, log p sub i, and you get to be where p sub i is the inner product p sub i squared, which uh, I think you have to do this numerically, but you get 1.36. Okay. Yeah. It looks like a, a zero error capacity somehow. It's a what? It, it looks like a zero error capacity kind of problem somehow. Or uh -huh. Is that my intuition? Or? <coughs> okay, so. It does look like Lovas's proof of the zero error capacity of the five cycle. Which one is coming? Which channel? Um, but yeah, I don't, I don't, I mean, this isn't zero error capacity yeah, because yeah, there's yeah. definitely error in the lab, but it, yeah, so, uh, so it's uh, not zero error capacity. You can define quantum zero error capacity if people have, you know, have proven some things about that. So, yeah, so one code word, you know, well, using single symbol code words, you got one, I got log three minus one. Using two symbol code words, you get a rate of 1.369 over two, which is larger. And you can ask, well, what about still longer code words? Well, Coleo observed this in 1973, and the actual answer for what's the class of this channel wasn't until 20 years later. And so what Olego and Schumacher Westmoreland proved was that the classical information capacity obtainable using code words composed of signal in states rho sub i, where rho sub i has the <coughs> marginal probability p sub i, is what is called the Olego information on the ensemble, the probability distribution p sub i of these states rho sub i. And that's just the entropy of the output minus the entropy of the output given the input. So entropy of the density matrix minus the average entropy of state rows of i. So if these rows of i's were all rank one, this curve would be zero, and it would just be the entropy of the density matrix. So we'll give a very quick sketch of this proof for the special case of pure state rows of i. And you could ask, does this give the capacity of a quantum channel, a uh, noisy quantum channel? So the possible capacity formula would be maximized this Olego information over all possible probability distributions over output states of the channel. Yeah. So this is a um, channel where now our symbols are Rosalai, where the symbols were pure states before? Yeah, because now the symbols are Rosalai. Yeah, I mean, the inputs are I and the output is a pure state, as a mixed state rows of I. So yeah. And then these rows of I's have an average density matrix rho. And so this should be bigger than or equal to the previous capacity because it's a more general symbol. Um, well, the previous capacity was where rows of I was equal to V C I. So this should be a special case of the previous thing. Uh, or rather, the previous thing should be a special yes, case. Yes, exactly. So this should be and in fact, the previous thing is where this last term is zero because oh, okay. h of a rank one that's uh, matrix is zero. So that's just h of rho for the previous thing. And we can ask, does this give the capacity of the quantum channel, or noise of quantum channel? And we'll get back to that question later. <coughs> so how do you prove this? Well, it actually looks a lot like the Shannon proof. Well, there's three, three steps. There's a random coding typical subspace and a, what's called a pretty good measurement or a square root measurement. So here's where I stopped. Here's where I start you know, waving my hands a lot because there's no way I can possibly give this proof in, in the last 25 minutes of this lecture, for example. 
So we're going to choose code words to use the by equal vi1 tensor vi2 tensor dot 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 tensor v sub i. Where v sub i is picked with probably v sub i. And the, the v sub i's are picked independently. So these are the code words. We pick code words with the probability distribution for each symbol. And now, u sub i will all be very close to the typical slope case of row. And that's essentially the same proof as for the modern progression. And to decode, what we do is project onto this typical subspace. So if this, if this operation fails, and we check the complement of the typical subspace for control. And then, but that's a rare event. And then we apply the pretty good measurement, which distinguishes between each of these code words. And typical subspaces, we've gone through this before. So maybe I'll skip this. Typical subspace is the subspace of typical, typical sequences of eigenvectors. And a pretty good measurement. Well, we have a whole bunch of code words and code words use of i. And we want to distinguish between them. So we'll let phi be the summation of i use of i use of i dagger. <coughs> So actually, these code words are the code words after the projection into the typical substance. Which is one thing we want to distinguish between them. Because remember, the first step is we projected on the typical subspace. And now we want to distinguish between the projections of the code words on the typical substance. So the POVM, the major use of the of VM with elements P sub i equals 5 to the minus 1 half ui, ui dagger, 5 to the minus 1 half. And if you add up all of these, you get 5 to the minus 1 half. And these, when you add up all of these, you get 5, and you get 5 to the minus 1 half. So the sum of these is the identity matrix. And that means that this is a P of the N. And the probability of error of the state use of I set is just 1, that is use of I dagger 5 to the minus 1 half use of I. So this is a calculation you have to do. And now the overall probability of error is this. And there's this beautiful sequence of inequalities which shows that this is small if n is substantially less than the dimension of s. And u sub i is a random code. So why does this work? Well, you know, very clever sequence of inequalities. And in fact, a pretty good measurement can be shown to be within a custom factor of the optimal information. So the information obtained by the pretty good measurement is, or right, sorry, the probability of error of pretty good measurement is only no more than some custom type of probability of error of the optimal measurement. So that means that we didn't really need to project on the typical subspaces at all for the coding scheme to work. But if you look at the derivation of these inequalities, we need to do projection to make these. And they follow these work. Okay. Now, that gives you the capacity of a CQ channel. We now look at arbitrary quantum channels. So, yeah. that, that is corresponding to any real system? Or maybe you have a user and an optical uh -huh. fiber? And a, does it correspond to anything? Well, an optical fiber is definitely, a laser with an optical fiber is definitely a quantum fiber. Um, Channel, although, you know, that was a special case where, you know, you could. That's okay. We'll we'll get. I'll get to this later. <laughs> okay. So we can look at arbitrary quantum channels. So what is an arbitrary quantum channel? Well, I for an arbitrary quantum channel, we can look at the information we can send by just looking at possible output. Maximum flavor information for those. So this is a lower bound of classical capacity of the quantum channel. So what is a quantum channel? Well, I'm not going to tell you what it is yet. Or I will tell them. So it takes a density matrix and up this density matrix. So rho, the density matrix in, goes to summation over i, a sub i, rho, a sub i dagger, where a and i and a i are arbitrary matrices satisfying a i dagger and a i. Mm -hmm. So why do we need this? Well, this property ensures that this, if we put 
trace one symbol into the channel, you have to trace one symbol out of the channel. And it's easy to check that if you put a positive permission matrix into the channel, you get a positive permission matrix out of the channel. In fact, you know, each of these terms is AI row, AI dagger is positive, it grows positive. So that means when you have them all up, So this is a map that takes that to make this to Betsy. In fact, it turns out to be arbitrarily, turns out to be any map that takes density matrices, density matrices can be expressed in this form. But I'm not going to prove that. I'll talk a little bit more about that later. So here was our accessible information. The accessible information, what we restricted ourselves was putting, you know, we put some input into each and for each of these channel users, we made a separate measurement, and then we uh, combined these separate measurements to figure out the most probable received message. And we, what we got, we got the accessible information of, you know, maximizing for all probability distributions of inputs to the channel, the accessible information of the output of the channel and the probability. So we saw we could do better by actually making a joint equation on the outputs. So we have unentangled inputs and we make a joint equation on the outputs. And we maximize over all probability distributions on inputs of the labeling equation of this. So, you know, there's an obvious question. Suppose you have an entangled input and an entangled output. Can we send more information? Can we increase the capacity of a channel by doing entangled inputs and entangled outputs? Now we can show that this turns out to be the maximum over all probability distributions on inputs to the to uh, the channel extension, which is the you know, when you look at the tensor product of n uses of the channel. So that's channel on uh, the tensor product of n input spaces. <coughs> and now you take the labor capacity back, divide by 1 over n, and take the limit as n goes to infinity. So you have to regularize this um, expression. And that is, this is the actual capacity of the final channel. <coughs> and you can ask, well, do you get more when you regular, when you we use entangled inputs and you get entangled outputs. So that turns out to be the question is a label capacity of N1 tensor product N2, where N1 and N2 are going to channels equal to the label information of N1 plus the label information of N2. If it is, then the label information gives you the classical information capacity of one channel. If not, you do need to take this limit and those are going to be 1 over N. The limit always exists. What? The limit always exists. The limit always, the limit always exists. Some sort of subadditivity. Yeah. So there's a subadditivity lemma which shows this limit exists. Actually, I suppose if you have a infinite dimensional channel, you could come up with cases where that limit is infinite. It still exists, <laughs> just a bit of the yeah. So the additivity of classical capacity was one of a number of interesting open additivity questions in quantum information theory around 2000. And I showed that the following four open questions were equivalent. The additivity of the minimum entity of the output of the quantum channel, the additivity of the entanglement of formation, which is something that I have some slides on that, but I'm not going to be able to get to them, and the additivity of the label capacity of a channel. So there were a bunch of very important activity questions. And in 2008, Hastings showed that, well, one of them is false, which meant that all of these equivalent questions are false. So nothing, none of them is active. So how did we do that? Well, Shannon's entropy is the limit of radian T entity to 1. And so a natural generalization is the multiplicity of 
minimum rent to the input. And this was proved false for P bigger than 4.79 by Ferrer and Palaio, who, you know, they chose, they found a channel, uh, well, found a class of channels for which when P is bigger than 4.79, this fails. And then Winter, Andreas Winter proved this was false for P bigger than 2. And Patrick Hayter proved this was false for P bigger than 1. And then Matt Hastings, a year later, proved it was false for P equals 1. And what is the channel? Well, <coughs> you choose k random unitaries, you survive in the dimensional space. And you take the channel as just, you apply one of these unitaries at random to the final state and the channel. <coughs> and now, you can also apply the inverse of these we have a conjugate channel which applies the <coughs> one of the inverses of these unitary matrices at random. And then we show that this is not at So the minimum entropy of the output of the channel n conserved n. n conjugate is less than the minimum output entropy of n plus the minimum output entropy of n conjugate. And the hard part of that is showing the right side because if you put in an entangled state, show that this is actually very, I should say very small, this is actually, you can estimate the minimum entropy output in the entangled state in this channel very easily, and showing that the minimum entropy output of just one use of this channel is bigger than half of this minimum entropy output is, well, it was really a uh, very, very nice paper that showed this with lots of interesting techniques in it. So I haven't put the corresponding channel to the map. It's a physically reasonable map with density matrices and density matrices. So what's physically reasonable? <coughs> well, it has to be completely positive, it has to be trace conserving map on our emission matrices. So why linear? Well, quantum mechanics is linear. So anything you can do with quantum mechanics is going to have to be linear. Trace preserving. You must take trace one matrices to trace one matrices. We call density matrices, which are closed states, are trace one. Positive. You must take positive semi definite matrices to positive semi definite matrices. And completely positive means if you tend to go back to the identity map, and tends to run stays positive. So that says look at a joint system where you apply this channel to part of the system, and you don't do anything to the other part of the system. There still has to be a reasonable quantum channel. So, Peter, uh, yeah. the, the requirement of linearity, would that be equivalent to the, the fact that in the classical case, uh, we view channel as, say, a, a Markov transitional gradient? Right. So, yeah, the classical case, this is just saying that the, um, you know, the channel is going to have some probability for each of the states goes to some upper state. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. And a trace preserving means that if something, if a channel wasn't trace preserving, then probabilities wouldn't be preserved in quantum mechanics and all sorts of things would go wrong. And you know, positive and completely positive. So if you look at the transpose, it satisfies the first degree, but not the fourth one. So the transpose map is linear, trace preserving, and takes positive matrices to positive matrices. But if you tensor the identity, it's not completely positive. So that's the example which said you need criteria for. Or excuse me. So another characterization of quantum channels is how operating sum represents any quantum channel. Criterion, which essentially means that the channel has to be trace preserving. And the third characterization is the Stein's free annihilation theorem, which says any quantum channel can be first viewed as first embedding 
the system into a larger public space by adjoining Space with some in some fixed uh, in some fixed state, and then applying the unitary transformation to this larger public space, and then throwing away part of that public space. You get it. And then you get so you take a partial trace of the public space. You remember that corresponding throwing out part of the public space. You get the output of the channel. Now what I'm going to do is try to convince you that there's a whole bunch of different capacities for quantum channels. So we've already seen one capacity, the classical capacity of quantum channel. Okay, so that was the limit that n goes to infinity, one over n, has a number of maximum number of distinct messages you can send using n use for the quantum channel and have small error probability. Okay. Now I'm going to um, <coughs> go briefly divert, you know, briefly make a little um, excursion into some properties of quantum systems. You cannot send an unknown quantum effect over a classical channel. So how would you do this? Well, you have to measure the unknown quantum effect, send the results of the measurement over the channel, and reconstruct the final bit on the other end. But By the rules of quantum mechanics, this turns out to be impossible. So one way to see this is the no cloning theorem, which says you cannot take quantum bit and take you cannot take an unknown quantum state and make two copies of it. So this attorney called is forbidden by the rules of quantum mechanics because this is not the unitary transformation. So if you had, if you could take phi, turn it into a classical channel, well, you can send a classical channel to the spheres, both of whom can reconstruct the quantum state, and that's the possible. So you cannot send a quantum state over a classical channel. But suppose you have a noise that's quantum channel. You put the unknown quantum bit in the channel, you send it, and the receiver gets it. Well, we've just sent an unknown quantum bit over a noiseless quantum channel. Essentially, by the definition of a noiseless quantum channel. And further, quantum error correcting codes exist. So you can use them to send an unknown quantum bit over a noisy, but not too noisy quantum channel, and have an arbitrarily high probability that the quantum bit gets through. So that says that every quantum channel has a quantum capacity Q. So we now have two capacities, the classical capacity and the quantum capacity. And clearly, the quantum capacity is less than the classical capacity. Why? Well, if you can send quantum bits, you can encode classical bits into quantum bits, send the quantum bits, and then measure the quantum bits to get the classical bits. So the quantum capacity is less than the classical capacity. OK. Now, let's make another little deep before into things. Teleportation. So if the sender and receiver, I just said, we did not send a quantum bit over a classical channel. But if the sender and receiver have access to a source of shared entanglement, we can actually teleport quantum bits over a classical channel. And I'm not going to tell you how to do this. <laughs> it's, it's basically a fairly simple calculation. So you start with a quantum qubit, an unknown quantum fixed side. The sender makes a measurement. And she measures, makes a joint measurement. Okay, so the sender and the receiver share an EPR pair of qubits, which is in, say, this state. So the sender makes a joint measurement on her unknown qubit and this EPR pair. Well, that gives four possible outcomes because it's a four dimensional space piece. So she sends two classical to the receiver. And then he makes a quantum transformation on his. Half the EPR pair, and remarkably, you have the qubit in the exact same state that the input is Okay, so we teleported a qubit over a classical channel using the EPR pair of qubits. There's a
thunderous process, which I can explain to you how it works, which is you have super dense coding. So Alice takes two classical bits, encodes them in her half of an EPR pair of qubits. She sends her half of an EPR pair to the receiver, and he makes the measurement, which gets the two classical bits. So if you have in shared entanglement, you can take two classical bits and encode them in one one bit. Okay. How does super dense coding work? Well, remember Alice and Bob start with this bottom state, 1 over root 2, 0, 1, minus 1, 0. Then Alice applies one of the four Pauli matrices, which are just unitary transformations, which we can do by the rules of bottom mechanics. And if you apply the identity transformation, you get the same state. If you apply this transformation, it multiplies the phase by minus 1 if Alice's bit is 1, which means you get 0, 1, plus 1, 0, because the second one gets multiplied by that. minus 1, because here, Alice's two bits are not in state 1. So that gives you 0, 1, plus 1, 0. And these two give you 0, 0, plus or minus 1, 1. Now, these four states are all orthogonal. So after Alice has applied her, the poly matrix to her first qubit, she can send her half, or her qubit of the CPR pair to Bob, and Bob can make the measurement which distinguishes all four of these states. So, getting one of four possible states is two bits. So, now we have a measure which bit. And teleportation is the commonest process to super dense coding. Alice has to keep it in the unknown state. So Alice makes the same measurement that Bob made earlier on the unknown qubit and her half the EPR pair, and sends Bob, tells Bob which of the four possible <coughs> states. And Bob applies, I don't know why he's done this, he applies one of the polymatrices to his half of the EPR pair. That puts his qubit in the state side. That says that if you have if the sender and receiver send share entanglement, sending one classical bit is a, uh, sending one quantum bit is exactly the same as sending two classical bits. So we can define entanglement assisted properties, which is you know, suppose you have a noisy channel, and the sender and receiver share entanglement. Well, we know from teleportation superintendent coding that the quantum entanglement system capacity exactly one half of the classical entanglement system capacity. Okay, so we have a shared entanglement. We have entanglement system capacities. So you can ask, can you find formulas for CQ and C sub D? Well, we already know that we found a formula for classical capacity, the maximum over the entropy of the output minus the entropy of the output given the input. Of course, it could look exactly like this. Entanglement is the capacity of the fundamental law of entropy output plus the entropy of the input minus the joint entropy. And the final capacity is the analog of the entropy of the output minus the joint entropy. And you know, note that this property, this is funny, for classical variables y and x, this is always negative or zero. And that says the final capacity is zero for classical channels which we already knew because you cannot send any bits over a classical channel. So, what, does this, what is the analog of this? Because, well, we're talking about entropy of the output and the joint entropy, but because, and the entropy of it. But because of the nature of quantum channels, if you have, you know, if you put the input in the quantum channel, well, the channel is going to destroy the input before it produces the output. So there's no such thing as a joint entropy of the output of the input in one channel. So I'll tell you what entanglement is. And I really think I should make a diagram here. So here's the center. And the center is going to have a reference system, the center P, and a system A, which she puts in the quantum channel. And then Quantum channel, quantum channel, take that. 
So before quantum travel, the state is in R A. Four. And we'll require that the state in the reference system and input state space is um, that this is a pure state. So that says that um, on R A. Three more minutes and I'll be done. What increases the capacity of quantum channel? Well, entanglement between different channel uses. This was the additivity question. This helps. A classical feedback channel from the center to the receiver to the center. Well, in quantum thing, quantum um, information, you can show this helps. And prior entanglement shared between the center and the receiver. Well, we just thought this helped. So, now you can ask, well, you have to have a quantum capacity. You can have a back channel from the receiver to the center. You can have a classical side channel, which is two ways. Or you can have a quantum, or you can have the center and receiver share entanglement. Well, once they share entanglement, it turns out side channels no longer help. So you have what Q sub E is bigger than equal to Q sub 2, bigger than equal to Q sub E is bigger than equal to have C sub B, the classical capacity of a channel, quantum channel with a back channel, and classical capacity of a quantum channel. And there's also, you can define C sub 2. So here we have to require that the center and receiver don't cheat by sending all the information over the side channel. <laughs> so how do you do that? Well, you just say that they send anything, the message sent over the side channel has to be independent of the actual message that they want to communicate. So you assume that there's an enemy who's listening to the side channel, or at least listening to the forward side channel, and so you don't want to send any secret information over this forward side channel. And now you can get, you find Q, Q, D, Q, 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 E, C, C, E, C, C, E, C, E, and these are all different. And aside from the, these inequalities, there do not seem to be any relations between them. And then you can also ask, well, what about private classical information where um, <coughs> the, um, where the, um, you have a eavesdropper which knows some information about the quantum channel, but not more than the laws of physics allow. And you can ask, well, how much private classical information can you send? And then have a, the third row of these things. So you get lots and lots of capacities of quantum channels. And these red ones, these three red ones, have nice 
entropy formulas, although for Q and for C, you have to regularize them because they're not binary. And Q is a nice symbol, symbol 